the founder of Heroes in Blue, retired Tampa Police Chief Jane Castor, State Senator Gerald Malloy, and civil rights activist DeRay McKesson. Good afternoon. Now we got to do better than that in Charleston. Good afternoon. Are y'all fired up? Fired up? Give yourselves a hand. It is my honor to be the moderator of this uh, panel on criminal justice and policing. And we're going to get right to it. I'm going to ask each panelist to answer this question. And I'm going to read so I don't mess it up. We are witnessing people all across the country committing violence for all sorts of reasons, reasons that they're willing to die for. Whether it's because racist views held by Dylan Roof, which is a case that brings us here today, distrust of police as in Dallas last July by someone who was reportedly angry over police shootings of black men, or the frustration and detest of the political system as we saw it play out this week in Arlington, Virginia during the Republican baseball practice. Now, of course, we must take into consideration the impact of mental illness may have on these acts of violence. But even if we incorporate mental illness into the question, it's important to find genuine, truthful, and honest ways to curb, preferably eliminate, the tragic results of the conflict we've experienced for way too long. Each of you are leaders. This is the question. Each of you are leaders in your respective communities what immediate steps can we take to stem this tide? We will start with our police chief, our former police chief, Ms. Castor. All right, thank you very much. I'm uh, quite honored to be a part of the panel. Just for the audience's knowledge, I was a police officer. I was born and raised in Tampa, Florida, and I was a police officer there for 31 years. And I spent the last six years of my uh, career as the chief of police in Tampa. And one of the things I know that no one will believe because my mother herself doesn't believe this and tells me all this all the time about how violent our nation is. And the reality is, is that crime is lower now than it was in the 50s. But the problem is, is that you get to see these acts of violence for 24, 48 hours at a time. But certainly, none of us can deny that there have been, in the recent past, um, many, more, many more acts of violence, just as, as were described. One of the, what I feel, two, two things that we need to do, and I want to expound on those, is from a law enforcement perspective, we need to understand Law enforcement officers need to understand the individuals that we serve, and the citizens need to understand what law enforcement does. Uh, David Brown, the chief in Dallas, is a friend of mine, and I, I certainly agree with him when he says that we're asking the police to do too much these days. Police officers are mental health counselors. They're everything, addiction counselors, you know, raising children, stopping crime, whatever comes surf bubbles to the surface, give it to the police, they'll take care of it. And we are the most visible arm of government. So if someone has um, an issue with any arm or branch of the government, the most visible representation of that is law enforcement. Now, there's a couple of things that, uh, stories that I wanna give from um, a law enforcement perspective. One is something that I talk about all of the time is that there are 800,000 police officers in the nation. One of the unique things about law enforcement is that we are judged as a profession. If you look at public perception of the medical field, it's everyone holds doctors in high esteem. If a doctor kills a patient, then they say, well, he probably shouldn't be a doctor, but everybody still holds doctors in high esteem. If you look at law enforcement, something like Ferguson happens, 
and every police officer in the nation is personally blamed for that. And the same thing if an officer dies in the line of duty. So our public perception chart looks like an EKG chart. And, and, and we certainly accept that. But we have to understand the people that we are policing, and that's very important. You know, I, from my standpoint as an officer, can't understand how people have the fear of police officers when they're pulled over. People that say, if my son's African American, he gets pulled over, you know, you have to show your hands, you do these things. And I think, well, that's what I do as well. But then we have next door neighborhood, which I know a lot of people have, and a woman in my neighborhood posted a photograph of her 17-year-old son saying my son's a good, a good child and he makes good grades. Chief, if I'm you... gonna have to ask you to wrap okay. it up. Okay, uh, uh, all right, sorry. That's yeah. okay, can you close but it? But the point there is that I would never have to consider doing that with my children who are 17 years old because they are white males as opposed to. So that's one is understanding each other. Number two is people, when you see something, you need to say something. If the individuals that come out after the fact about Dylan Roof saying he showed all of these signs, why didn't someone come forward and say that? D. And Ray. I think that's important. D. Ray, she mentioned Ferguson. Um, I know that you are active in the national movement for social justice. Can you just piggyback on any thoughts you have along the lines of the question and offer any thoughts uh, responsive uh, to Ferguson? Yeah, so I'll start by saying it's an honor to be here and it's always good to, to have these conversations we can't change and we don't talk about. Uh, your question is interesting because you frame it in this couch of violence, right? And it's always important for me to differentiate between the violence that institutions and ideology plays out on people versus the violence of private citizens, right? So when we think about community violence, the violence that happens in communities, that is violence between private citizens, and we need to deal with that and the manifestations. That is different, though, than the violence of institutions. So what does it mean when there's institutional violence, when there's a country that uh, injected a disease and a set of black people in Tuskegee and didn't tell them, right? That is violence. What does it mean when you don't allow people to read? That is violence. What does it mean when there's an officer who shoots a guy who's running away from him? That is, in, that is the violence of institutions. And until we talk about that violence, like I think we'll never move forward, or we think about Dylan Roof as the violence of an ideology. What does it mean when white skin just means more to you than other people's skin like that is, that is violence too. Um, when I think about Ferguson, the reason that we stood in the street, both there and in cities across the country, was because we thought that people should be alive today, right? That, that people can do bad things and that the penalty for all bad things isn't death. And that if there's a penalty, there should be a process for it and officers shouldn't get to decide what that penalty is. And I too am sympathetic that people have hard jobs, like that makes sense to me. But again, I think about Slager. I don't know how hard it was for him not to kill him. I, that doesn't make sense to me, right? And I don't think you need 200 hours of training to know not to shoot somebody running away from you. Just like Jordan Edwards, who just got killed in Balt, out, in Balt Springs, Texas. The car was going away from the police officer. I don't know how hard it was, how many training sessions you need not to shoot a 15-year-old in the head like as he's driving away. That doesn't make sense to me. So that, to me, uh, I worry about that. When I think about Ferguson and all the other cities, I think about protests is this idea of telling the truth in public, that we stood in the street to tell the truth with our bodies, that Mike and Rakia and Ayana should be alive today, that we disrupted board meetings and commissions to tell the truth that they weren't using their institutional power in ways that benefit the lives of people of color. And that I know a lot of people who are interested in like having the conversation about the world being a better place, but not having a conversation about how we got here. And until we talk about how we got here, I don't know how we move on from here. Interesting, interesting. <laughs> Miss, Miss Aaliyah, do you wanna respond to the question? It's a broad question and I'll let you kind of have your way uh, with any opening comments you have. Well, it, I, as with the other panelists, I'm immensely humbled to be here and to follow up on those two strong points. I look forward to this dialogue. I came here thinking, what can I add to this conversation here today? And if there's anything I can add, I hope that it's this, that I hope that we can seek to be more open to one another, that we can seek to understand each other, and I think that's where the basis of change comes from. I uh, 
you know, when my husband was killed, he was a Forest Acres police officer killed uh, close to two years ago in Columbia, South Carolina. And when he died, I felt called to speak out and say that if we're going to talk about this case, let's humanize it. Let's talk about the man that was shot. Let's talk about my husband. And, you know, I'm proud. I, I think our local media is strong. Um, and I, I think perhaps that voice, it, it changed the dialogue away from black man shooting white cop to talking about the humanity aspect of it, I think. Um, and likewise, at the sentencing of the man who killed my husband, you know, it was, it was heartbreaking leading up to that case. It took many, many painstaking months and nights without sleep, and to, but I found love and empathy in my heart for the man who killed my husband. And at that, me, at that sentencing, I called for empathy for him. I said that I don't know this, his story, but there are too many things that can lead someone to a life of violence or crime or to those actions. And I wasn't, it wasn't just me. Greg's family also called for forgiveness. And if you listen to that case and if you go back and look at the news, you'll see that it was, it was a very forgiving situation and that we were able to hear the tragedy of a man who shouldn't have been in that position, who, who had a strong family, who had a strong background. And what I said is that when it comes to these cases, we need to take each case and think about the humanity in them and hear those stories. Because when one person dies, no matter who it is, we're all broken. When one person dies, there are no winners. We are all losers. And the only way that we can come together is by looking at how do we help someone? How do we find those that are hurting, who don't have enough resources, who are in pain, and lift them up and come together to make change happen? Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Aaliyah. And uh, <laughs> State Senator. State Senator Malloy, you want to respond to the question and give any opening comments you might have? Sure, I will. And uh, thank you, Senator Kempson, for, um, for hosting and, um, and being the moderator for this event and being a part of this all-star panel. I've had a chance to meet everyone um, backstage and have followed um, all of your careers, believe it or not. And um, I've been in the Senate now 15 years. Many may know that I've represented Senator Pinckney and his family since the terrible tragedy here in, um, uh, in Charleston. And I just want to just add just a couple, a cu couple of things. Um, I've said this before, during difficult times, people of strong will can make a difference. The first story is sad when something bad happens, but the second story can be quite inspiring when people of like-mindedness will come together to do things for good. It is tremendous that Ms. Aliyah would take on the cause that she has taken on and have empathy in her heart for her husband's assassin. It is, it is terrific for Mr. McKesson to take on the issues that's been true to his beliefs in his childhood and his professional life to end up making a difference. And for the chief to have 31 years of police experience to bring her knowledge and wisdom and experience to us. So what we are doing is, is that we're having a start here, which is the communication. Um, and we have to end up having that talking and talk about hard issues. And it can't be just about the talk because we've been talking for a period of time now. And my grandfather always said this one thing, do what you do. And so if we all do what we are doing and take one step up to do it better, to end up making the opportunity for, to help someone else, I think we can end up making it better. In my situation and in, in the Senator from Charleston's situation, we gotta have communication in our world, he says, what can we do? We gotta do it in the political way as well. And that means that we gotta talk across the aisle, that we gotta have bipartisan solutions, that we gotta have work that continues, that we gotta take the P out of politics and out of party and put it into people. Because the people are the ones that actually matter. And when we start seeing that if it affects anyone, then it affects all of us. And so I think that um, from this conversation that we'll start, and we only have a little bit of time, I think that there are some nuts and bolts that we want to get into, but I think from our particular situations, I think there's something that we all can do, but I'm not interested in so much what, all, what, what we say here today. I'm interested in what happens when we leave from here tomorrow. Thank you, Senator. Um, Chief, and, and, and how I want to unfold this conversation, if you, I'm going I'm to ask somebody a question, and if you want to jump in, and sort of comment or question the panel member, feel free to do so as appropriate. Chief, statistics reported by the Charleston police 
revealed that Charleston leads the state of South Carolina in the number of public contact or investigatory stops, which are police stops that do not result in a citation or arrest. These stops are often for minor violations, such as a missing tail light or brake light, and a window tint too dark. And these statistics show that African Americans are twice as likely to be stopped as whites, and a significant disparity exists in the percentage of African Americans involved in these stops and their percentage of the population. Is this data indicative? This is a big issue in our community here. Uh, there was a meeting on it last night. Uh, is this data indicative of a racial bias in public contact stops, and do you think it contributes to the fear and mistrust between the black community and the police? Say yes to the end, that that definitely um, contributes to the fear in the community. Uh, to say that that is, and, and I would bet that those stats hold true throughout the United States, not just in this area here. But it's a little more difficult of an issue to say that it's indicative of racial profiling. Um, does racial pro profiling go on? Yes, it does. Uh, but you also have to understand that the way that law enforcement deploys their officers are that officers, it's in, in our particular community where I'm sure it is everywhere else, they're deployed in a grid system. The higher the calls for service and the crime rate are, the more police officers you have in those areas. And so quite often you have more police officers per square block or mile in a congested uh, city, so you have more of those in the lower income areas, more police officers. But that is an issue that law enforcement needs to be aware of. I know it occurs, and it's something that um, certainly needs to be addressed and, and needs to, to come to the front. I, I, I do want to respond very quickly to um, you know the, the incident about Ferguson. Every situation that you brought up, you're correct. You know, no officer should have to be trained not to shoot somebody in the back. But a statistic that is, is not often known, for example, in my organization, we took 900 to 1,000 guns off of the street, off of individuals every year. So that's 900 to 1,000 armed encounters, potentially deadly force could be used. But our officers only shot or used deadly force two to four times a year, four being the highest, from zero to four during the uh, time that I was the police chief. So it's very rare that officers do use that. And if you have 800,000 police officers, there's a lot more good than the negative. And, and I, I agree completely that those issues were uh, inappropriate and that the officer should be held accountable. That's what we don't do as well as hold officers accountable enough. S Senator Malloy, you've done a lot of work in this area. I remember one of my first committee meetings, you uh, it dealt with texting, and you made sure that the South Carolina law didn't include stopping a passenger and searching the vehicle as a pretext uh, reason uh, to search the vehicle. In other words, stop a police officer can pull a person over but can't use texting as the pretext reason to search, to search the car. Talk to us about well, I think that, um, again, it's wherever you are is, is where you make your difference. And all of, there's, there's no person's an island, so you got to do what you do in your arena. And so um, in my world, um, practicing law, I had seen encounters that I wanted to make sure that we address as a, as a policy um, issue. So on the seatbelt um, issue in South Carolina and on the texting issue, I made certain that one, that we put the racial profiling component in it and basically what we're doing is we collect the stats um, over at the Department of Public Safety. And the, the question becomes is that, now who, so now we can tell just by um, race um, is, is that who they're stopping. Um, what do you do with that data is, 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 is the next issue. But I think that we want, we want to make certain that if you, we had a reason that there was um, probable cause for a stop, we want to make certain that there had to be a bifurcated um, um, issue there. And so, Long story short is, is that we want to make certain that we can treat it from the law perspective as fair as possible. Now, from an educational perspective and a police perspective, 
that is another issue that we have to continue to address because we have a, a distrust in the community of some of police officers. We have a, some police officers that would, that would believe and know that you have a person that would work during their career and, and if it came down when something happened that was bad, they would come out and say, this would never happen. But when they see it on camera, then they say, okay, well, it did. And so those are the types of understandings that we have to end up getting to. I know I went outside your question, but I wanted to respond well, in, in I that I appreciate that, that. And I'm coming to you, D. Ray, if you want to respond. And then, Ms. Alley, I got a question for you. Did you want to respond to this? Yeah, just, uh, D. D. Ray? Just three quick things. One is, and I am, again, sympathetic, and I've been on a lot of panels with the police in the past three years. Uh, but I'll say that like, you don't get an award for not killing somebody, right? In the same way that I was a, I was a sixth grade math teacher and I didn't get an award for not like flipping out when, when one of my kids didn't understand fractions, right? Like it was expected that I wouldn't flip out, that I would like show up the next day and I'd teach fractions again. And that was like the expectation. So I'm, I'm never swayed by the police presenting data that says like, you know what, we actually didn't kill people. And you're like, well, you okay, like you shouldn't kill people though. Like the expectation is that you are able to do your job in a way that doesn't damage or harm communities. And again, we've seen time and time again when white people have posed a danger to society that there are many ways that we can deescalate. But with black bodies, it's like the only way to deescalate is by killing people. And like, I just won't accept that. And I say that as somebody who has met with President Obama about this, the White House Task Force on 21st Century Policing, like we've seen that there are solutions in this area and I just like won't accept a pat on the back. I won't uh, do that for the police because they just didn't kill people. Like that is sort of odd to me. Uh, the other thing is a way that when we think about the data is that I don't know how much data people need to believe in racism. Like I, it's like people's stories aren't enough. The data shows it's racism and like the way that we explain it to sort of make it disappear is fascinating to me because we don't do it with white people. So when we look at like education statistics and it shows that white kids are outperforming everybody, immediately white people are like, white, white, the kids must be smarter. It can never be like they're better resourced, like there's a history and a legacy that like has led to this. And when we see black kids underperform, it's never that they are just under-resourced and that they come from a legacy where they weren't allowed to read. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a third generation reader. My great-grandmother was the first person in my family who could read. That's wild. That is wild. And like, I just don't know what it looks like when we will explain those things away. Like that is sort of fascinating in terms of when we think about moving forward. Thank you for your response. Uh, I'm gonna cut you off. I know you had a couple of more points, but uh, <laughs> Miss Alley, yeah. Aaliyah, Miss Aaliyah. I'll, I'll respond to Fred, I said that before. <laughs> Aaliyah. <laughs> Uh, I know your husband, you, you mentioned this in your opening comments, uh, was a police officer who was shot and killed in Columbia in 2015. A lot of the initial news, as you mentioned, focused on a black man killing a white cop. What can you talk to this audience about the problem that creates, or whether that creates a exacerbating division between police and communities of color, and talk about your organization, uh, Heroes in Blue, and how it's addressing the polarization uh, issue uh, along these lines. Absolutely. Um, first of all, I would say, I would hope that someone would celebrate. If I were having to teach fractions to middle schoolers or high schoolers, I'd probably lose it every day, but that was a good point. <laughs> um, yes. I, when you pay attention to news stories, it, it seems so quick, and I don't blame the news for this. I think that we as people are just as much to blame for what the news narrative is saying because it's what, what we say in our posts when we share them. It's in our narrative when we're talking to people, when we're texting and the stories that we are sharing and clicking on. And it seems that they are the ones, what I would challenge is I think that they are the ones that further reinforce what we already believe or further enforcing our own personal rhetoric. And so when Greg died, I wanted to speak out and say, I, I, this will not become just another statistic. This will not just become another case of either an officer being shot or an officer shooting someone. And I think that that should apply to all cases where we should celebrate or at least celebrate maybe the, celebrate and honor those that the lives that were lost and so through our organization, you know, I proposed the hashtag Heroes in Blue at three in the morning the night after my husband died in a Facebook post. And 
called to bring awareness to the positive things that happen every day. My husband said in our kitchen one day, he said, Cassie, for every neg one negative story you hear every day, there are thousands of positive stories every day that go unnoticed. And that's where Heroes in Blue came from. And I don't, I very much believe in, there is no doubt to anyone that I am a proud law enforcement, I'm a proud wife of my husband, I'm a proud law enforcement supporter, but I also feel very deeply and very deeply appreciate the continued discrimination that, in, that exists in our country. And I think that in all stories that we share and the things that we pay attention to, we need to be thinking about who are the people that are involved in their story. We can't make each story just another statistic. We need to humanize whether it, no matter what it may be, that there are lives that are involved. And I think, you know, going back to the point about the statistics about the, the stops, um, I talked to a lot of officers leading up to this panel about those numbers, and it was interesting because there were so many different answers that were presented. And what that said to me was that those numbers are, the issue is complex. But underlying it, I think one of the big things that stood out to me is thinking about how those statistics relate to other disparities that exist in our community, disparities related to poverty, crime, lack of education, lack of health care. There's so many continued disparities that exist. And if we can come from a place that assumes that police and uh, police included want to help and are here to serve, then we can come together to say, okay, well, let's, let's come together about how we resolve these issues and disparities. And that's something that we're trying to do through our Compassionate Acts program, is provide police officers with the resources when they see a need or have an idea of how to build and better our community, that we're gonna fund those ideas. What did you learn about your husband's killer? What do you, did like, you, learn you, about it? What uh, do you mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you, you uh, in, in the summary you sent me, um, you, indicated that you spent some time trying to reconcile why he would do something like this and learning about him. Yeah, it was, um, so where it stemmed from was we were asked to give our recommendation for sentencing, which I think is a miserable thing for anyone to have to do, you know, to have to think about what you would want for someone else's life is a miserable, heart-wrenching thing. And you know, my husband lived for 32 years and he died one day and everything revolving around that case was focused on that death. and. I got through um, his death in the large part by not thinking about Jarvis Hall, the man who killed my husband. And by having to think about sentencing, I had to think about him. And I remember I was driving one day, I was following a really tumultuous meeting, and I was like, how am I going to, it looked like it was gonna be a long trial, and which broke my heart. And I was like, how am I gonna be in that courtroom every day perhaps for months or even years on end, over and over again, and go home and love my son and be a good mom. And I had to stop and think about Jarvis Hall. I had to think about what are the different situations that could have put him in this place, and it is true. There is more, black men in our country are more likely to lead to a crime of violence, and it's because there are a lot of systemic factors in our community that can lead to that, and there are a lot of things that can put someone in that position, and, and that wasn't even, didn't even seem to be his case. And the fact is, we don't know his story, and we have to start to think about that and find peace. And because we are open, I think we are able to hear the tragedy, a, an immense tragedy for a man and his family and their loss as well. Senator, thank you. Uh, Senator, I want to come to you now. Um, now, you chair criminal justice uh, division. Um, of the National State Legislative Conference, all the state legislators across the country. In the 90s, I'm sorry, in the 80s, many critics of the American criminal justice system complained that the penalties for crack, the possession of crack cocaine, a drug off, most often used by poor blacks, were much harsher than the penalties for possession of powder cocaine. Thus, in uh, August of 2010, the President signed the Fair Sentencing Act, which eliminated the five-year mandatory minimum prison sentence for the possession of crack cocaine. There has been a rise in opioid addiction. There has been a rise in opioid addiction facing the nation and facing epidemic proportions in South Carolina, and rightfully so, we are seeing an immediate response by our leaders to push for rehabilitation versus incarceration. Do you find the emphasis on rehabilitation for opioid users and not the people who abuse crack 
as somewhat of a contradiction. It's a lot in that, it's a lot in that um, question. I, I think that, let me give you just a, a bit of background is that we did have the Criminal Justice Task Force in South Carolina. It was started in 2006 by um, then Senator Glenn McConnell, who's now president of the College of Charleston. We also did have the sentencing, um, honorable sentencing bill in 2010. It all started in 1980s when there was in our country a declaration that there was a war on drugs. And so what we know is that the war on drugs did not work. What we did was we incarcerated people at an alarming rate and we are filling up our prisons. And so at that point in time, now is, is that we get to a couple of, of factors. One, politics is about priorities. The data matters because it is a tool. It is not the thing that we can see when someone shoots someone in the back. We can see that these things that we know. But in the General Assembly, when we are talking about issues, we got to be able to end up having some evidence-based criteria, and it's just used as a tool. It is not totally convincing. It's something that we end up having to have. The 80s, the war on drugs didn't work, and so there was a determination that needed to be made at some point in time whether we were, were a rehabilitative society or a lock em up society. The truth of the matter is, is that we're not going to pay to be a lock em up society. And so what we found in South Carolina was is that the number one incarcerated offense in our Department of Corrections, you know what it was? Low-level drug offenses. And so, you know, we didn't do what Maryland did. We didn't decriminalize marijuana, but we added administrative um, um, surcharges and conditional discharges so that the people can get to work and those can end up having, having some ability to be able to pay their responsibilities because we made it a, a crime. The problem was is that we needed to become smart on crime at the same time as being tough on crime. Some wanted to be tough on crime, but you also got to be smart on crime. And right now, what, what we have is, is that we have six prisons that have been closed. Getting down to your question is, is that, is there an emphasis on it? Um, there's a lot of discussion about it. And the thing is, is that but it's important for us to be gatekeepers of the system that we have. I think that behind, your, behind the question is, is that, that it's racially based in a lot of the, lot of the usage in some people's, um, um, I guess, um, submissions. But at the end of the day, what we have to have is that those folks, they need treatment all the way around. And what we've done is that we've added all to try to put them into trafficking statutes and put mandatory minimum sentences on them. And we're filling up our jails, and all of a sudden they eventually get out. They, we don't have um, a, a tool for the criminogenic factors to have them to put back in the society. And so the emphasis is, is coming on it, but the issue is now is, is that crack cocaine, powder cocaine, and our bill that we passed, they're all equalized now. And so the weight um, the weight is the thing that we end up con considering. The federal government obviously could take some lessons from what has happened in the states because they got low-hanging fruit and they got the sentencing guidelines. And what you have is that you have a lot of people that are incarcerated there for low-level drug offenses, for long sentences, and they should not end up being incarcerated for that period of time for those Let offenses. Let me get like sure. a 30-second. Sure. I was there during the crack cocaine epidemic, and I can tell you that that was the destruction of many African American communities, and that those laws weren't passed in a discriminatory manner. It was to try to, to get a grip on that. I, I personally witnessed families that were destroyed one after the other. It hit like a tidal wave. And hopefully, instead of being discriminatory, it's more that we've learned that you can't you can't arrest your way out of any situation that, especially with drugs, you have to look at rehabilitation. The end result, the end result was is that those that were getting incarcerated was a, was a disproportionate number of African Americans because it was, it was the type of drug that was, that was in, in play. Now, it was prominent, and now, as we saw this past year, that there was an attempt to end up putting the other um, drugs into the trafficking statute. And the trafficking statute is just outdated. Right. D. Ray, this question is for you. You are an organizer, 
Uh, you do, you're a man of many uh, different skills in terms of your organization. Black Lives Matter, uh, instrumental in several protests, Michael Brown and Alton Sterling, and you founded Campaign Zero. Many states have passed legislation mandating body cameras for police officers, including a bill that uh, Senator Malloy and I sponsored in South Carolina after the shooting of Walter Scott Jr. by a North, North Charleston police officer. Do you think this tool has been effective in tr providing transparency and accountability for police officers? Yeah, so when we think about solutions, you know, I hate talking about body cameras just because everybody, body cameras is like the hot topic. People think body cameras are going to change the world. I think that body cameras are one of many things that can be solutions. You know, some people are doing fascinating research about using the audio from body cameras to detect aggression in officers, so not just using the video at the site of trauma, and I think that is really interesting. We think about some other stuff that'll be solutions. You know, a lot of the police union contracts around the country protect officers at all costs, so their contracts that say that the officer has to be disciplined in the least embarrassing way to the officer in the department. And you're like, I don't even know what that means, right? Like, what, is, what does that mean as like a clause in the contract? Do you play, think about places like Chicago, where the officer's discipline, disciplinary record is d uh, destroyed every five years. It's like, what does that mean as like a public servant when your discipline record is just destroyed, right? So I think there are a host of things that can be solutions. I think that body cameras are like an easy thing for people to think about. It does tip us off to think about this idea of surveillance and what does it mean that we put people in communities, so or police in communities. So body cameras can be a bad thing in communities where you think that a police officer should just be on every corner. So I remember when we met with Valerie Jarrett in the White House and she's like, Duray, community policing. And we're like, Valerie, community policing is race space for a lot of us, right? That like in the most affluent part of Charleston, and I haven't been here much besides for the protest, I can bet my everything that it's not like flooded with police officers just like in people's neighborhoods. But in the poor neighborhoods, this idea that like they need the police, that if the police aren't there, violence will ensue. And that is a really race-based way of thinking about like how we place police in, in community. That it's not just the data, because the reality is the data is not, like, think, in white homes, domestic violence is underreported. Now the heroin use is not a crime. It's uh, like a mental, it's a health condition, which it should be. Both my parents were addicted to drugs, so I'm, that makes sense to me. But think about how we're not, the crimes just aren't reported in white communities. So it's not that the crime isn't happening, but it's like when Timmy gets pulled over for drunk driving, he is, like, escorted home, and Daquan is arrested, right? So it's not that, like, the crime didn't happen. It just isn't being reported. So when we talk about this idea that like we're putting police where the data shows, it's like, well, that is, I think, an easy way to think about it. I don't know if that's the most real uh, way. Uh, Chief? That is not true. And, I mean, that makes for great headlines, but I, I would like to know if you have ever, have you ever ridden with a police officer? Have you ever gone out on a ride along? I've been with police officers, not on a full ride along. No, I'm talking about going out on duty with a police officer to ride along. In have you any, ever, any community in the nation, you have can you ever ride performed along an open heart anytime. surgery? Have I ever what? Have you ever performed a surgery? <laughs> I'm just asking because you probably that's, have thoughts about what makes a good doctor. That's unreasonable. What I'm no, saying no, because is you probably have thoughts have, about what makes a good doctor, but no, you haven't performed no, a surgery. No, what I'm saying is. I have is, thoughts about what makes a good officer, and I haven't gone on a ride along. Okay. What I'm saying is that you, we need to understand each other's as Sir Robert Peel, the founder of law enforcement, said, the police are the community and the community are the police. We have got to understand each other. And to say that, you know, am I a surgeon? If I ask you to go on a ride along, I think is a little bit no, out there. No, but you're asking Just this to idea understand that, like, what police officers do. That if I have not done that experience and I don't have a right to have an expectation for it, and when I'm saying that you probably expect your doctor to perform a certain way, no. and you're not, but you I don't have expectations for your doctor, well, that is incredible. I expect my officers to understand the community that they're policing, to understand what is important to them and to understand what standards they want upheld in that particular community and then to do that. And to say that the data is skewed, it's not. It's the 911 calls that easy. come in and Senator, the crimes that are reported. Well, Senator, that's how officers are We're talking are about body cameras. Well, I, have to, um, um, I think that you, body cameras um, are a useful tool. Um, I, I think that, um, that there's a couple of things that, that happen is that it protects the officer, it protects the citizen, and it protects the truth because you end up having to end up seeing a picture 
When Senator Pinckney gave one of his last speeches on the Senate floor about doubting Thomas, and it was after the Walter Scott shooting, and he gave the, a, a really a, a, a great speech about the fact that he would not believe that he was living Jesus till he put his hands in his side and felt the nails in his hand. But people will end up believing a picture whenever they, they see it. And a lot of times I understand the pros and cons that it relates to body cameras, but what happens is this, is, is that there are a lot of things that would, that have occurred that we don't see and that we don't get a chance to end up using it when it comes to court. Let's use, for, for example, Walter Scott. Um, it was not a body camera, but it was a, a camera. And so there's a, a, a question for the, the chief and a question for everyone else is that, would the forensics proven the case notwithstanding? And then, so we would like to think that it would. Chances are it would not. And so the issue becomes is that, is it an effective tool? Yes. So when we passed the body camera bill in South Carolina, it was the first in the country that would be the, it would have a mandate for body cameras. And I can tell you how it started for me, and this is great to, to share the stage with Mr. McKesson. My son Donovan, who's in the audience, wanted to come join you in Ferguson. And we sat around and we said, no, you can't go. And he said, I don't understand why. So it was more of a mom decision than a dad decision. <laughs> and um, it was that, you know, you gotta fight this battle from where you are. And so what we did then was is that we said, we're gonna fight this battle in the state house walls. So we filed this bill for, 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 for body cameras. Basically, when this case down here happened, then it started moving along a little bit quicker. Here's the issue though, and this is where it comes from. There's a lot of issues that, it, that relates to it. You gotta fund it, people talk about that. In South Carolina, we put $2.4 million of recurring money in it. We put another million dollars in for non-recurring. This past year, we had about $13.5 million in requests, but we only had $5.8 million that was given out to it. And so, what we do know is that complaints go down, okay, and what we do know that there is a safety mechanism. Is it the catch-all of everything? Sure. No, it's not. Um, it is, but it I, is a tool. We got to wrap this up. Uh, so we want to start with Miss Aaliyah. Uh, two minutes for a closing. Uh, any thoughts you want to have with to share with this audience? Oh boy, two minutes to reflect on all this. Pretty incredible. As we are talking about this body camera issue right now, just to take it, start from there, I'm not a police officer. I can't speak to the statistics. I can't speak to, I can't get into a debate that was happening on stage here today. I do know when I've talked to police officers about body cameras, they continually say that they're open to them. And in fact, when I talk to police officers about many suggestions for new policies, they're very open to them. When I talk to some, uh, South Carolina is a very rural state, departments no larger than eight to ten for many of them and when I talked to one small department in particular it's like we would love to enact our body cameras more and we need more money for infrastructure for how to implement them so that's one I think an example of the complexity of this issue and I think that overall when we're thinking about what these issues are here tonight and there's we're all here because we're passionate we're passionate for change, and we want to see change, some of us for different reasons than others. And when we call for that change, I hope that we can pause and think about the complexity of the issue, whether it's body cameras or statistics or the, someone who died that you hear of in the news. And Because how we think about them and how we share those stories creates ripples, effects of how people respond. So when we advocate, yeah, I could keep going. So you get me on a roll, but I guess that's my closing statement is that I hope that if anything, and I'd be happy to talk to anyone more about, I have so many different examples of experiences from both sides of how that impacts people, but just pause and think and challenge yourself to go outside of your comfort zone to really hear from someone who may be different from you, even if it hurts. And even if you come away with still your same opinion, it will come from a respectful, loving place. Thank you so much. You're right. 
you know, I'm reminded that we are in the street because we felt like we had to be in the street, that we tried everything. We voted, we went to the meetings, we called people, people ran for office and it didn't work, right? Or it didn't have the desired impact that people wanted it to have. So the street was the last place for us to force people to have a conversation that they were choosing not to have. And we would love not to be in the street. We're in the street in response to violence. So we, we believe that we should live in a world where there's no violence. We're in the street because there was violence, and I'm mindful of that. We also know that the world doesn't have to be this way, that the world is this way because people chose for it to be this way. And that's important to understand because that means that people can choose for it to be a different way. I think about my, my experience as a sixth grade math teacher, and I taught sixth grade, it was great. Seventh grade is puberty and deodorant, and it is bad. But sixth grade was amazing. And uh, one day, my students were like, I want to go to gym. And I taught 90 and 120 minute classes. And I let uh, them go to gym early this one day. And they came back. And I was like, why are you back? And I realized in that moment that they were in love with the idea of gym more than the work of gym. <laughs> and I say that because in this moment, people are more in love with the idea of resistance and the work of resistance. And my push to you is like, where are you in the work, right? Like, what, did, what are you putting on the line to make the world a different place? And that people think that the history of injustice in this country began with the Muslim ban. And that is wild to me, right? <laughs> this country was wild way before the Muslim ban. So we need to fix the Muslim ban because the Muslim ban is bad. Uh, that is not going to cure all the ills of racism in this country. So what has been interesting about this Trump era for people is that white people now are starting to understand that this implicates some too, right? Losing Obamacare is going to implicate a whole lot of people who didn't believe that the country could be a bad place for them and are now seeing that happen. So my push to you is where are you in the fight? Thank you. <laughs> Senator Malloy. I want to thank the sponsors again and, and thank this um, great panel for being here and having um, this um, discussion to start. And so I'll start by, by being with them and talking about you got young people here, you got law enforcement here, you got a person that's been a victim here, you got a person that's been in the political arena. And what we have here is this, is we got a lot of young people that's, that's out there. And um, we were talking about the Brown decision not too long ago. And there were some young people in the audience. And you know what they thought about? They thought Michael Brown Ferguson. But in truth, we were talking about education, Brown versus Board of Education. What does that tell us? It tells us that there's a lot of worlds out there. There's a group that saw civil rights in the 50s and the 60s. And you see young people that are seeing what Mr. McKesson saw and witnessed and was a part of um, back in, in Ferguson, I think in 2014. And so the same issue comes then and now and things in between. I had something that I came across and I, ha I think it fits into what we're saying. This is by Dr. King. And we have to keep in mind that Dr. King was also a little radical at, at times, but he was also a peaceful man. But this was in his letters from the Birmingham jail. He said, human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts of men, and I would say women as well, willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation, meaning not doing anything. We must use this time creatively in the knowledge that the time is always ripe to do what is right. And so we can talk about it and say what we're going to do but the work becomes in later on is that where do we go from here? So we need to be full, hungry, and in need, and in no plenty, and to ask for more, and to do more, all at the same time. Thank you, Senator. <laughs> Chief Castor. I will make mine very brief. Um, uh, 31 years in law enforcement. Um, a couple of things that I do know. One, we can't draw a line in the sand and just continue to lob bombs back and forth at each other that there has to be that conversation that um, some think doesn't work. I believe that it does. I can tell you that I've seen too much death. I've had to go through the hospital doors many times and tell families that their loved ones weren't coming home from duty. And I've also had to knock on too many doors to tell families, mothers and fathers that their children weren't coming home. And in the final analysis, really the majority of those deaths were for no good reason. And one of the things that I know 
in law enforcement, and I tell everyone, it all comes down to how do you treat people. And our mission at the Tampa Police Department was that everyone, everyone without exception was treated with dignity and respect. And you've got to understand each other. Understand your police department and what they do to serve you every day and expect that your police department understands and hold them accountable as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed something. And we get ready to get fired up. Fired up. Thank you so very much.